Good afternoon, everybody. To do justice in any way to the legacy of Liszt's works in the space of less than an hour uh, is uh, <clears throat> really not possible, but I hope at least to introduce you perhaps to one or two things that you haven't yet heard about this extraordinary man who was a one of the most thoughtful and enterprising musicians of his time and indeed of all time in Western music and whose originality is just a source of uh, constant wonder to me and I've been working with his music now for, well, most of my life. Liszt, as I'm sure you know, was very famous in his lifetime, so famous indeed that he was the most uh, sculpted person in the 19th century after Napoleon, and he was the most photographed man of the century. Uh, he actually made a lot of money, to start with from his uh, concerts as a pianist, but we forget very often that he only was making those concerts for a period of nine years, and yet people are still talking about his playing as if somehow or another they heard it. and. Um, and then he, he, he had several careers. He, he, he buckled down and became the Kapellmeister in Weimar for a period of 12 years where he conducted so much music it's almost impossible to imagine how he rehearsed it, let alone performed it. And in the meantime, we now know that he was also working as some kind of emissary for the Vatican for quite a good part of his life. And this is partly one, a reason why he spent so much time traveling around in general in Europe, but in particular between Rome, Weimar and Budapest for the last 26 years of his life, the bit of his life that he called his three-forked life. But um, so this will also tell you that he was a very good diplomat. He had the kind ear of almost all politicians and prelates and uh, there can't have been very many doors in all of the Western world that were not open to him. And this, of course, as these things happen, engendered jealousy amongst other musicians. But uh, Liszt rose above all of that. What he is renowned for as a human being is how generous he was to other musicians, how kind he was about their works, even if they were not nice particularly about his own, and how much money he earned and then immediately distributed to other people. When he died, he owned no property. He never owned a coach and horses. Uh, he owned the clothes he stood up in and his music and books uh, in two collections, one in Weimar and one in Budapest. And various pianos that he'd been given for the duration, uh, which are still dotted about uh, all sorts of parts of the world now, but uh, mostly to begin with uh, in Germany and in Hungary. And um, it's to his piano music that I'm going to concentrate because it's the easiest thing to demonstrate. But uh, it's a good idea just to remember that if you eliminated all of Liszt's keyboard works, and we're talking quite a lot of them, well, over 1,400 individual pieces, um, he would still be one of the most prolific composers of his time. And uh, worthy of our attention as a chamber musician, as an orchestral writer, uh, not just for the invention of the symphonic poem, but certainly for that, um, as a composer of organ music, as an absolutely splendid composer of songs across a very wide range of languages, and um, all sorts of choral works, sacred and secular, um, f four settings of the mass, one of the requiem, um, it's, it's an extraordinary list just to go through the catalogue of his works. And indeed, I've been working on a catalogue with uh, a sadly now deceased colleague, Michael Short, uh, to produce a comprehensive thematic catalogue of all his music, and that is now very well advanced. And so I hope it will be available before we're much older, or as always assuming I'm spared for much longer. Anyway. As most people know, Liszt was a prodigy. He uh, played all the well-tempered clavier by the age of eight. Uh, he went to uh, play to Beethoven when he was 11. 
and Beethoven uh, <coughs> gave him a kiss of approval and uh, told him he would uh, be a fine fellow. Uh, he studied for a bit with Czerny, he studied with Reiche, he studied a bit with Payer, and started to produce compositions from about the age of 10. He was already invited at that age to be one of the contributors to the compendium of variations on a waltz by Diabelli, to which Beethoven contributed 33 and 40 odd other composers, including Hummel and Schubert and the young list were invited each to compose a variation. And um, he went from there to producing some etudes which he had finished by the time he was 13. And also by the time he was 13, he had for some extraordinary reason been commissioned to write an opera for Paris, which he duly did. It's called Dansange. It contains almost nothing of his mature character but it contains much cleverness and, and he clearly was a very bright child and he knew exactly how to put together a piece of music that would be suitable and pleasing for a French audience. These days it's interesting just because it's the young work of a great man. But by the time Liszt was in his 20s, uh, he had already got to know Berlioz and he was uh, meeting Paganini for the first time he knew Chopin, he knew Mendelssohn, he knew Schumann, and in other words, his musical connections were as rich as you could possibly imagine. And when he first struck out a furrow as an original composer, it was with the same kind of devil-may-care attitude that many of the French writers of the time were uh, displaying, which is to say, it doesn't matter if only a few people understand this, this is really what I'm trying to tell you. So I just want to play, after a little bit of explanation, an early piece which he wrote when he was, well, he first drafted it when he was 22. And confusingly, for those who know his later works, it's called Harmonie Poétique et Religieuse. This title comes from poems by Lamartine, and Liszt later used the title to cover a whole book of pieces uh, at which he had several goes before he finally came up with the book that we now know with, which has ten works in it, one of which is a complete rewrite of this piece that he'd written when he was 22. But I think it's important to know exactly how it was that he first appeared on the music scene and how outrageous it must have seemed at the time. So I'd like to play this piece the whole way through, but just before I do, uh, I can tell you a couple of things about it. The tempo direction at the beginning, uh, written in three languages, four languages, um, uh, suggests that you play it very slowly and with a deep sentiment of boredom. The tempo direction thereafter is senza tempo. The time signature is absent. The key signature is absent. The left hand starts after a quaver rest so you don't really know where in any imagined bar it is. And when the right hand comes in with uh, a secondary part of the theme, it is displaced one quaver from where the left hand is so that the whole thing remains quite uncertain. But out of these two tiny little things, one is just a progression of notes that goes out and in, have heard in the Lacrimosa from the Mozart Requiem, or it could be uh, somehow a homage to the Archduke Trio, of which that is the essential progression of the slow movement. The, the melody that he introduces over the top doesn't tell you very much either. But the two things combined are going to produce a piece which is extraordinarily interesting to us because <coughs> excuse me, it um, lays bare some of the things that he really wants to do and possibly in a more organized way when he is older and more established. But we have bars which are in seven 
beats to the bar where he actually puts counting numbers on them so you don't get lost. Uh, he breaks note groups of notes down into five beats to the note. Uh, every section of this piece is based on exactly the same material as the one that preceded it, but the character that he adopts because of this uh, technique that he used, which he, of course, knew already from Schubert, but the uh, so-called um, tra transformation of themes technique, um, just to put it simply, um, in the Faust Symphony, for example, this is jumping well onto his life, but... also becomes and later becomes and turns into a right uh, rollicking fugue. Uh, this is a technique which is quite different from classical thematic development, but it's not incompatible with it. And Liszt used this technique throughout his life. And in this piece, he lays his credentials very clearly, and you pass through what amount to a number of variations, and then all of a sudden, he really turns it into an andante religioso, which is almost a piece of its own, still with the same theme, but extended, and then he interrupts it with the secondary part of the theme from the beginning and ends in as much incertitude as he began.
As you might imagine, this piece didn't go down particularly well with his close friends, let alone his general audience, and he kept it quite private, as he did most of his early original bits of music thinking until 
he decamped from Paris and uh, went to Switzerland, which he did essentially to elope with the Countess d'Agoult, um, who by then was pregnant, uh, with Liszt's first daughter, Blondine. At the same time as he was writing this sort of music, he also wrote a, a little group of three pieces called Apparition. And from these we can gather also that his skill as a romantic melodist was already there. Of course, we know it from one etude that he wrote back when he was 13. of course is now familiar to us because he used it again in the Douze Grandes Etudes in 1837 and then in the Etude d'Execution Transcendante in 1851 under the title of Record Dancer where it's justly renowned as one of his most attractive melodies and one of his nicest etudes. Well back when he was writing these Apparitions in 1834 he already worked out this notion of an orchestral sound at the piano, and this is just one small part of the first one, but I just wanted you to hear the sort of melody that he was capable of writing from the beginning.
which direction he was heading. His harmonic language is very rich. Um, it will have been noted, I'm sure, that he loved very much progressions that moved by a third. That sort of thing. And you will find them, of course, in Beethoven, uh, who the, uh, the later on you get in Beethoven's works, the more likely it is that he doesn't modulate the dominant, but instead goes off to some key, which is usually a third away from where he started. For example, in the, um, sorry. Uh, the second subject is in G, having gone from B flat. And this sort of key shifting became one of the ways in which the 19th century diverged markedly from the classical period. And we can see Liszt doing this uh, particularly in another work of 1834, um, which was um, the first piece in what was to become a volume called Album d'un Voyageur. And it was inspired by his having um, stumbled across the workers' uprising in Lyon. And, um, and that more or less appealed to his uh, egalitarian tendencies. But um, it's, it's, it's a sort of a march, but at the climax of this march is, is a harmonic progression which one can't help but feeling, and indeed knowing, that Wagner must have known because he quotes it 20 years later, pretty well note for note, in Die Valkyrie. Lyon. attention. And as did much else of Liszt's music, as we know, he had young Tausig go and stay with him uh, several summers to play all of Liszt's latest compositions to him whilst he was engaged in the composition of The Ring. So there was no secret about it anyway. And uh, <coughs> eventually at the first performance of The Ring, Wagner even acknowledged his debt more or less publicly. Liszt's Best known compositions all come from his time in Weimar, and goodness knows when he found the time to do them. He revised a great many of the things he'd written earlier and uh, produced over a period of 12 years 12 symphonic poems, two symphonies, um, an orchestral setting of the Mass, uh, various other orchestral works. 15 Hungarian Rhapsodies, the first two books of the Année de Périnage, the B minor Sonata, the Scherzo and March, the Grand Concert Solo, the book called Amenie Poetique et Religieuse, about 60 songs, uh, all sorts of chamber music. His largest organ music was all written during this period as well, including the revolutionary and magnificent Ad Nos Ad Salutarum Fantasy. Uh, and in the meantime, of course, he was working very hard to promulgate the music of other composers, much of which he transcribed for the piano. This is one of the most extraordinary literatures in the world, either as transcription or as fantasy on other people's themes. His imagination was endless. But, uh, you know, he, he'd started doing it when he transcribed Berlioz's fantastic symphony because orchestral performances of the day were very few and far between, and when they happened, they weren't particularly good. And um, indeed, the publishers weren't really keen on printing Berlioz's score, but once Liszt arranged it for piano, they printed that, and Schumann was able to use that score then as the basis of his excellent review of Berlioz's work. Liszt's uh, transcription was published in 1834. Liszt had been present at the first performance in 1830. And uh, the full score of of the Berlioz work wasn't published till 1849. 
so Liszt definitely performed a useful service for him. He also arranged, as most of you will know, all of the Beethoven symphonies for solo piano and number nine also for two pianos. And there are various other orchestral works which he transcribed, like the Weber Overtures and the Tannhäuser Overture of Wagner. And in between, he produced operatic fantasies on the operas that were current in Paris in the 1830s, like Don Giovanni, La Juive, Norma, Lucia di Lammermoor, and went on to write a number of paraphrases on operas by Wagner. He was also very much involved in conducting operas and conducted over the period that he was in Weimar uh, over 60 of them. And you need to know that he also produced and directed them. And so he, the amount of work that he actually put in in this period was just extraordinary. He used to sit at his music desk from six in the morning till midday, composing. In the afternoon, he would write letters. In between, he always managed to go for a walk, play cards, teach a few lessons, conduct a rehearsal. And in between, somehow he managed to uh, have a bite in the middle of the day and have a proper dinner in the evening. Uh, what, what was the uh, first casualty was clearly sleep. He probably didn't get to bed before one o'clock and he was definitely up by 5.30 every day. So that's the sort of life that he led. After he left Weimar, uh, I shall return to the, this music with one major work in, in a few moments, but uh, he was pursuing this uh, three-cornered life in various different places and he was also trying to write music that was not in the grand dramatic tradition anymore, but that was pointing possible directions of the music of the future. And he did it in an alarmingly pre prescient way. He'd already, with the Faust Symphony, stumbled across a theme which contains all 12 notes uh, of the uh, chromatic scale, arranged in a manner which would not have displeased uh, our dodecophonists in the 20th century. The It's a theme he first jotted down in 1847. Um, it's just like knowing that he'd written whole tone scales in his music as early as 1837, uh, but he'd written a whole piece in whole tone harmony in 1860, when we're still before the birth of Debussy. So he really was being revolutionary behind the scenes, even if these are the pieces that he didn't actually put out for much popular performance uh, until, uh, and, they, and they, some of them didn't see the light of day until he, he was dead. But many of them circulated privately, and so we, we know that he was notorious already for writing a piece called Bagatelle Without Tonality in 1883, and various other pieces when he's in his last years. Uh, leave tonality absolutely suspended. For, his, for the piano in his late works, he wrote three large cycles of pieces which are all important in different ways. There's a set of seven works called uh, Historical Hungarian Portraits, uh, which are kind of character pictures. And uh, these, of course, weren't published until the 1950s, but uh, they, they are an excellent set of, of, of really quite revolutionary works. Bartok knew them, but they weren't published at the time. And it was um, because, largely because the collected edition that was being made of Liszt's works uh, in the 1920s and 1930s had to be interrupted because of the Second World War. And then it was never properly resumed afterwards. And the new um, Liszt edition began at the end of the 1960s and is still very much ongoing. The other collections are the Christmas Tree Suite, which he was writing for his little granddaughter, Daniela, who was the uh, eldest daughter of Cosima, Liszt's second daughter. And Liszt procrastinated with the publication of that until 1883 because he kept on adding bits to the pieces or making them longer in one way or another. But uh, they, they turn out to be an excellent set and they're not greatly virtuosic and they, are, they vary between interesting 
harmonizations of Christmas carols to also things that are that could be described as portraits, including one of himself and one of the Countess Lagou. Uh, sorry, the, oh, beg pardon. He's, he, the other lady with whom he spent most of his uh, later years, the uh, Princess to Zion Wittgenstein, um, the last two pieces that are called Hungarian and Polish. The third collection <coughs> of piano pieces that he worked on at this time was the third book of the Anne de Périnage. I don't propose to play the uh, most famous piece from this set, the Jeu de la Villa d'Este, but I thought it might be nice to hear just briefly uh, one of the shorter ones, um, which just show how much he could do with what... Back in the day when he had this scale... Um, raised fourth and seventh, um, otherwise a minor scale. And this is very common in Hungarian and Gypsy music. And Liszt, of course, uses them in things like the Rhapsodies and also in the Hungarian, Hungarian Coronation Mass. But uh, in this one piece, which is called Sunt Lacri My Reorum, the title comes from Virgil. Um, does it? No, it doesn't. It comes from Propertius, sorry. Um, en mode hongrois. And um, this piece has, it's a sort of Hungarian funeral march. It apparently also refers to the same thing as his earlier piece funeral I did, which was to say the um, execution essentially of the entire Hungarian cabinet by the Habsburgs when the uh, revolution failed in 1849. This piece is, is quite stark. It's also, it's recognizably a romantic piece, but it's also, in many respects, a very modern one.
We just have time perhaps for one of the little pieces that Liszt wrote in his last years. There's a group of them and they all have characteristic titles as his compositions nearly always did have throughout his life. There are only a couple that don't, which we'll come to in a moment. The, um, this little piece is called En Rêve and it was composed for his young friend, as he calls him in the dedication, August Stradal, who was uh, one of Liszt's last group of pupils. And at the time that Liszt wrote this, Stradal was probably nine or ten. And um, this is one of those places where Liszt writes a disarming tune that sounds a little bit old-fashioned, but then goes off into harmony, which sounds at least as modern as Scriabin. This is one of a number of pieces of his last years which are technically feasible but musically of course quite difficult because there's no other literature like them uh, of, on which to base anything and you have to get deep down into your list to find out where such music came from. Well, one of the places where it came from was of course the main body of work that he wrote when he was in Weimar and whilst he was in Weimar writing large-scale works for orchestra. He also wrote his handful of large-scale single-movement piano pieces. And the most famous of these by a long distance is the uh, Sonata, his one and only. But the Sonata was preceded by two other works which also incorporate the idea of several movements in one. One was the Scherzo and March, which he wrote for a competition in Paris. And this piece uh, essentially has two movements which are distinguishable, except they then combine themselves to perform an indissoluble whole by the end. That was one way of going about it. And the other way of going about it, which is what we see from the Sonata, is something which he had already been working on in the piece I'm going to play now, finish with, the Grosses Concertsolo, which is a large-scale work in one movement, but which contains 
all of the elements of a slow movement as well in the middle. It, it functions like one large scale sonata form, but it has also much thematic transformation as we mentioned before. And it is the embodiment of Liszt's mature harmonic style. It's a very important piece for a number of reasons, not least of which is that it was the immediate forerunner of the sonata, but also because ever looking for piano makers to come up with new ideas that would help Liszt write the sort of music he wanted to write, he challenged them with a passage in this piece which is written on four staves, and the top two staves are marked to be played with the pedal, and the lower two staves are marked not to be played with the pedal. Um, this, on a piano in 1850, was absolutely not possible. And it wasn't possible until the uh, invention of the pedal that Liszt had been asking them to build for decades by the time it finally appeared in 1883. But um, in the meantime, Liszt was so tired of people not being able to play this piece the way he wanted to hear it, that he arranged it for two pianos and when he got to this difficult passage, he simply divided it between the two pianos and one plays with the pedal and the other one doesn't. Uh, that is, of course, a solution, but that means you have to have twice the number of pianos, not to mention twice the number of piano players. These days, we can do justice to this piece because we can use the pedal that he intended you to use, even if it hadn't been invented at the time of the composition. You'll hear it. It's, it's, um, it's quite a way in, but it's quite clear when we produce... Uh, get to a sort of passage that's like a funeral march with these chords sustained and underneath them This piece, in many ways, is an embodiment of everything that Liszt wanted to do, structurally, musically, and, of course, without it, the sonata wouldn't be what it is either, and nor would the Faust Symphony. Uh, it, this, this piece really is him laying out for once and for all exactly how he thought a large movement could be put together and remain a convincing whole and um, not breaking up into the traditional multi-movement scheme. Uh, he didn't want to tell anybody if there had been any extra musical uh, uh, inspiration for this work. So like the Scherzo and March and the Sonata, it has no characteristic title. He didn't know yet what to call it. Uh, he could have called it Concerto without orchestra, I expect, but he didn't do that he, he, because he'd reserved that title for something else which in the end wasn't published, but he did just call it Corsus Concert Solo, it just means large concert solo, which is not very mysterious, but it's not very um, poetic either. And he wrote it for uh, his great friend and fellow composer, Adolf Henselt.
Thank you.